escucha bien ahí? ¿O tengo el micrófono lejos? Más o menos, más cerca. ¿Ahí? ¿Can you listen? ¿Ok? So, where... Let's start. Yes. So, uh, welcome today. I'm, um, I'm Pablo Valenzuela, if you know me. And I'm going to move a little bit from the biolog biological aspect of the previous talk. And I'm going today to classes. The first one is about complex system in general. I will to try to give some fundamentals of what a complex system is, how we model, and some examples that could be uh, useful and that are uh, prototypic and very important in the development of the modeling of complex systems. Um, of course, you can interrupt me uh, anytime you, you want. Uh, so this, this talk is intended to be basic. I have not the slider there. So the first question is, What is a complex system? A complex system has two essential features that distinguish, is a, distinguish a, a complex system from a very complicated system. A complex system has emerging behavior. It, it, it means that the whole is greater than the, the, the sum of the parts. And also, it's self-organized. Self I mean, there is no central authority, and the system tends to spontaneously organize in um, some level displaying special spatiotemporal patterns. <coughs> One of the pioneer articles um, highlighting the importance of complex systems was uh, due to Philip Anderson, who published in 1972 in Science the concept of physics and emergence. And he said that the behavior of a large and complex system aggregate of elementary particles cannot be understood in terms of the extrapolation of the behavior of its components. And each level of complexity, new properties appear and new physics appear there. I mean, even though we know the uh, standard model and we know all the properties of particles, the interaction and the aggregate of different levels just uh, create new physics, and this new physics is as fundamental as previous physics. Also, Thomas Wyszek was, uh, he was one of the first to propose a model of flocking. The model of flocking was very, uh, several groups here uh, chose uh, to, to present. Uh, Thomas Wyszek um, also uh, published this comment in Nature, in which uh, he made his statement about complexity, where this complexity is an inherently concept that ranges from physics to other disciplines, as for instance, linguistic or sociology, or even more disciplines. So, I mean, it's a very interdisciplinary uh, concept. <coughs> he again, he said the new feature emerges when one moves from one scale to another scale. This is the basic concept of complexity, and deal with the principle that go governs this behavior when we change with scale is, is our challenge to understand a complex system. And also, there is no um, unified theory, as, as, as also the, um, Mauro said before, there is no a theory of complex system. So we are trying to understand several aspects by focus on in, in different problems. Example of two complex systems, one of these is your popular choice, a burden flux. It's a flux of starling. Can we explain the behavior of the flock just merely extrapolating the behavior of single birds? Or can we explain the behavior of a brain? This is a picture of fMRI, a movie with brain activity. How do we explain how different patterns appear 
just because you know, we know how a single neuron behaves? Well, the answer is no. And this is what they deal with uh, understanding and modeling complexity. Starling flocks move, Starling, sorry, moving coordinate flocks. Flocks of different sizes has the same pattern of movement. But each bird just only see the, bird, the, near, the, the birds nearby. So how coordination without a central authority emerge from single local interaction? This is what Mauro was telling with the neurons, and uh, also Gabo is going to speak tomorrow. But we can see that there's a common frame uh, for different problems from different disciplines. This is one of the papers of Sterling Flux. I, I don't know if the people that we are going to talk about the, 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 the project because several people cho choose the paper of Flux, but there are two papers of Flux, the one of Bialek and the one of um, Andrea Cavagna. Yes? So in the break, we are going to uh, speak with the groups that chose the, the, this paper. So, Also the brain, I'm going to be more specific tomorrow in, in my last class, that what we know about the brain, we know about the brain that the brain was very studied in the um, circumstance of different uh, aspects, different type of behavior, in memory, etc. But from 30 years to now, uh, people also start to uh, study the brain in the resting, in, in resting state. In resting state is when the people are doing nothing. So when people are doing nothing, this, the brain is still working. And the way it works is uh, the, the way it, it works that the, the human brain is organized in dynamics anti-correlated uh, subnetworks. Yes? And how these subnetworks uh, appear and disappear, how they behave, how they form a, a spatiotemporal pattern is, is one question that is related with dealing with complex systems. And of course, what I'm, uh, the same concept of complex system can we seen is instead of neurons or birds, we have people. So when people interact, they produce collective behavior. In particular, I'm going to, in, in the second class today, I'm going to, to speak about process of opinion formation, in which people that have a, a, a certain opinion about a given issue, they are prone to share their opinion when interact with each other. And as a result of this interaction, it's formed group of uh, same opinion that, uh, of course, we can see that this uh, kind of uh, spatial telephone pattern also. And the mechanism for which people change their opinion about a certain subject could be different one that we, want, we, we are going to explore later. So what are the common elements in complex systems? Well, a complex system is, made, is composed of many components that may interact with each other. There is no central authority. There are local nonlinear interactions. There are emergent behavior. And this is the common framework what we have for this different problem. So how <coughs> these are different examples in which we have the same framework from different problems, from uh, pattern formation in nature, biological development, anthills, starling flock, shoals, brain and cognition, social network, internet, etc. And when we have, for instance, ensemble of uh, people, we would like to study things like opinion formation, group behavior, but also there is a, a review paper in the list of paper that it has about 200 two, uh, pages that is not um, intended to any one of you 
uh, make a presentation with these papers, but this is a very nice um, review of different way of simulating all these kind of uh, problems. Language dynamics, cultural dynamics, migration, etc. Also, when we study brain, the collective behavior of social brain are thoughts, action, movement, etc. So, <coughs> how we deal with um, modeling complex systems? Well, physics have learned to build relatively simple models, uh, as Mauro uh, told us uh, yesterday, in which, for example, the, the percolation, the direct percolation model for avalanches. And uh, it's, they are simple <coughs> and elegant, but sometimes are um, limited. Also, people who work with inherently complicated system I, as a biologist, they also try to understand the, this object of study in terms of simple interacting definite units, for, for, for instance, proteins or neurons or genes and still gene networks, et cetera. Um, so one approach to this kind of problem is to perform simulation based in complex networks or in Asian-based modeling that is I'm going to tell you today. We are used to model. We are used to, uh, even though Sometimes, on some uh, context, it could uh, appear that simple models are not uh, very good models. We use these simple models. This is a map of the surrounding of my house. And this is a very simplified picture that has the important information if I want to go from one side to another or have a picture of how the streets of a neighbor or, or, or some other place run. So this is a very simplified model of uh, one part of Buenos Aires. <coughs> In this simplified model, we leave out a lot of unnecessary details. So the art of modeling, and also Mauro and Gabo are very, very good exponents, is to show these minimal ingredients that are very relevant to explain the, the uh, emergent behavior. We have to make a, a hierarchy of variables. Of us. Even though a complex system depends on many, many variables, there are few ones that maybe are much more important than others. So the art of modeling is to find which are these few variables to explain the collective behavior we would like to analyze. Oh, okay, this is always in the same uh, direction that the, our understanding of modeling is uh, an abstract and very idealized uh, model, and uh, we are uh, not going to reproduce reality, but just to understand a certain behavior in terms of minimal ingredients. The three main features of complex system models are they are finite in size and time, and this could be relevant for some problem. Uh, Phoenix, uh, finite size fluctuation could uh, be very relevant for the outcome of our, our, um, our problem. Also, finite time simulation, finite time analysis, also relevant because many times it is not possible to assume equi equilibrium, and we have to deal with uh, out of equilibrium systems. Heterogeneity even in the agent or in the, in the interactions, could crucially affect the observed properties that, that we are going to see in, in, in few slides. And also, interactions. The backbone or the main concept in a complex system is the nonlinear interaction among the units. So, let's suppose that we want to make a model of a given situation. This situation is known as the standing ovation problem. Have you heard about this? 
this was first stated by Thomas Schelling. I want to take of Schelling in the next slides. And also um, by Scott Page and co worker who have a very nice approach. This is, let's suppose that there is a performance, and after that, people start to applaud. They are getting more and more emotional. One stand, and people start standing. How this happened? This all are move because they're so emotional that they stand in without taking into account the neighbors, or there's some process of social contagion. If we want to model this, which are the minimal ingredients we want to take into account to have a minimal model of this problem? Well, let's play a little bit. Sorry. <coughs> this is a, a it's, it's, it's very well described in this, in this book. I have the PDF of this book, if you are interested in. Uh, an Introduction to Computation Model of Social Life uh, of John Miller and Scott Page. Both are professors in the Santa Fe Institute. And also, this very nice book, Mic Micromotives, or Micromotives and Macrobehaviors, that is a very nice uh, book of Thomas Schelling Nobel Prize in 2005. And it's go to the heart of complex systems, micromotives and macro behaviors. So even though it's a very simple problem, the social dynamic responsible for taking into account the standing of all of these people could be very complex. When the performance ends, the audience must say whether they remain seated or stand and applaud. Yes? Of course, it is decision. It, it, it decision were simple personal, it will, will not be a, a very interesting problem because what happened, I mean, I have to just to think of different individuals without interaction. But people doesn't stand simply <coughs> based on her, her or his own feelings. But because they are, could, could suffer some time of contagion from, from the others. So this behavioral could respond to different strategies, to different uh, um, pictures, how they, they should behave in group, or how they should react to the performance. So if we want to model this problem, let's start from the basic. Let's assume that we have an audience of n people, n agents. Each one receives a signal that depends of the quality of the performance. We can hypothesize some functional form of, for that signal, but given this, this function is i of q, where q is some uh, measure of the quality of the performance. And we can also add some diversity, just assuming that people are not every same or they are not receiving the same signal, and this diversity could be modeled easily by adding oh. running out of batteries. I know. By adding a white noise. Yes? And let's assume that Every people stand up and applaud if this signal is greater than a certain threshold. And this threshold is just a measure of how move on how the, the minimal um, emotional feeling that he, uh, uh, above which he, he should stand. It's, it's okay? Well, as we said before, if, we <coughs> if all people only respond, okay. ah, yes. 
if people only respond to, to the emotional or to the performance, there is nothing interesting in this problem. But let's add some additional parameter, alpha, that gives the percentage of people who must stand, who must stand uh, in order to ignore, ignore the signal that is coming from the, from the, the performance. I mean, if I am a people, I could uh, stand and applaud because two different signals. Because I, I touch, because the performance, I mean, because the signal I receive is above certain threshold, or because a percentage alpha of people in this room, they stand up, and I should say, OK, if, I mean, I say 20 people stand up, I should stand up and applaud also, because every is applauding, and maybe the performance was better than what I thought, or whatever. So, which, which are the, the outcomes of these problems? What, what do you expect as collective behavior? Well, there is a very simple model, and the, the, the solutions are very simple. In some initial moment when the performance ends, a certain group of people will rise. If this amount of people is above the threshold alpha, the other people are going to rise also, and all the auditor is going to stand in and applaud. But if the initial group doesn't, doesn't reach this threshold alpha, just the initial group of, uh, of uh, people are going to applaud. So there is two solutions, because this, this, this dynamic has two, two instances. Of course, if we think in this problem and we think in the previous video, this is not very realistic. It's very simple, but it's not very realistic because there is only two uh, rounds of clouds, and uh, it could be an initial group or, or a whole. There is no round of different applause. So if we want to model <coughs> uh, add some ingredients to this model, we can uh, thinking, for instance, that we can see the people in certain places of an auditorium. As if we, we can picture a spatial um, um, landscape where we place every person in a given um, seat. Also, we can assume that people are not going to the theater alone, but they go with friends, with family, or certain acquaintances. So there are not surrounding one stranger, they have some attaching to different people that it's surrounding. Also, we can assume that different positions in the theater are uh, give me different ways in when I feel the, the performance. So it's, uh, or in the way I, I choose my location, it could be depends on my a priori Pre, um, idea that what's the um, the performance it could be and I can be more um, biased to get emotional with with the audience. So <coughs> if we add all this ingredient to the model, so the problem changes dramatically because now the same people could respond different depending of where he's lo uh, located, or to whom who is surrounded. So with this model, <coughs> we, can, uh, uh, we can have a different kind of dynamics. Uh, we can have a first round of standing, then more people uh, sum up to this, um, to this applause. We, have, we can uh, have avalanche of applauses with, of different sizes. And of course, this is the, the price for give, having a more rich behavior is that the model is more complicated. So this is a play to, uh, to see if we want to model this problem from scratch, which are the ways and, uh, in which we can just write a model and, and, and study the, 
the dynamics. So, which are the tools we are going to describe complex systems? Well, our idea to describe complex system is to simplify the problem by to keep some measure of their complexity. How can we do that? Well, I'm going to talk about two different strategies. One of them is using Asian-based models. And the other is using complex networks. And we can use complex networks in two different ways. For describing the backbone of the interaction among agents, I mean, is as a sub-ingredient of an Asian-based model, or as I'm going to tell you tomorrow in the last class, to describe the emergent behavior using what we, we know as functional networks, in which the topology of the network describe the, the collective dynamical properties of the, of the system. So what are the ingredients of an age-based model? Agents could be persons, voters, but could be institutions, neuron, brain region, animals, whatever are the minimal ingredients, gene, proteins, whatever. Uh, interaction between agents. Each agent is going to be defined either by, by a variable uh, which can, can take different um, states or even by a, um, a dynamical unit. <coughs> Plus interaction between agents that could be um, mapped in, the, in uh, using complex networks. And with this combination, we are going to study the global emergent behavior of, of this system of agents. So the, the, the usual methodology when we, revise, uh, we, we check the literature is basically make assumptions about agents, the behavior of individual agents and their interactions, and then use computer simulation. Basically, we can also do analytical result um, to observe the consequence of this assumption at a global level. OK. One of the first and pioneer um, <coughs> work using age based modeling is due to Thomas Schelling. Thomas Schelling was an economist. Uh, anyone know Thomas Schelling? Anyone else? He was awarded with a Nobel Prize in 2005 because understanding of conflict and cooperation through uh, game, th um, game theory analysis. But what I'm going to uh, tell you now in the following slides is his model to explain segregation. These are the reference. The segregation problem, even though this report is from 1991, this become early, is the observation that in many American cities and in other ways, racial segregation <coughs> can be traced back to segregated, separated neighborhoods. I mean, neighborhood leaves people of one kind of condition, of one kind of race or a given collectivity, and they're separated in the space, forming patterns, forming clusters of similar people. So the paradox is that when people are interviewed about what, how are this, his or her preference for living, the vast majority say that they prefer to live in integrated networks. So can how can we have this apparent paradox in which if people prefer to live in integrated networks, why they live in separate neighborhoods? And 
Schelling <coughs> answered this question. There is in, in the first reference a very uh, nice comment that he, he said that he was flying in a plane and he started uh, to think in this problem. And in order to think this problem, to order his ideas, he started to, to draw X and circles in order to represent two different kind of people. And he started to move it around based in individual preference. And he realized that it could give rise a separate patterns, patterns <coughs> of um, a segregated uh, person. So <coughs> the Schelling segregation model is a cellular automata. This is a particular case, a simplified case of an agent-based model. I mean, that is a, a discrete system in which each agent has a very simple behavior taking discrete um, states. And also, the time evolution is discrete in time. In this cellular automata, the individuals somehow prefer integration. They don't, don't want to be part of a minority. Uh, if they are not comfortable in the place they are living, they can move around. For instance, let's picture that we have a grid. If we have two kind of agents, the red agents, the blue agents. And we have also empty places. Yes? <coughs> and we, we, are, we are going to assume that each high agent has a conformity threshold. This threshold, H, is the minimal amount of similar neighbors needed to remain in place. I mean, if I am a neighbor, am I a, the number of similar neighbor is above certain threshold, it will remain there. Otherwise, it will move because it, 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 he or she doesn't comfortable there. Let's take this example. For example, I focus on this agent. He's surrounded by all of this. And let's assume that his conformity threshold is about 40%. He checked his neighbor, and he has one, two against six neighbors of the same color. So just 33% of neighbors are like him. He's not comfortable in this situation. So he decided to move to another location. For instance, here. When he or she moved here, it appears that the amount of neighbors needed for he feel comfortable there is enough to remain there. So this is satisfied. This doesn't move anymore. It's OK? Yes? No, no, no. It's a random place. Okay. Random place. So what happened is we do this. How is the dynamics? Well, these are. Some simulation made by Seba, who, Seba Pinto, who uh, gave me a hand with this. This is how the evolution of the systems looks like if the threshold is 2. <coughs> what do we see? 2 is a very low threshold. So people just need two people like him of the same color to remain there. So there are a few changes, a few relocation processes. And it ends with all the agents satisfied. There is no, no more change. What happens if we increase the threshold? So just our, now to be comfortable, I need at least four neighbors like me of the Eight possible. So I start moving, or all the agents start moving, and start to appear patterns of similar people. If I also increase this, <coughs> also patterns of neighbors start to form, and we, we can see that it's grow.
until the system reach an equilibrium where all the neighbors, the agents are satisfied. But if we still increase the threshold, what are going to happen? Yes, there is no possible that they move and it's very difficult that seven of eight neighbors has the same color. So the system doesn't reach the equilibrium and the nodes are all unsatisfied. We can plot this If we plot the size of the biggest fragment as a function of threshold, we see that there is an intermediate range of threshold when the clusters of similar people are higher. This is the segregation uh, area. Of course, it depends on the density of initial because the possibility of moving depends on the, if there is empty places available. So it probably will depend of this, but this work was very, very important in the development of models to understand social behavior, because it showed that even with a very slight preferences, I mean, I can say, I just with almost 25% of my neighbors being like me, I'm not racist, I just, I need to feel comfortable. But with this slight feeling, even a slight preference generates total segregation. So we can see here how a simple local dynamics could generate global patterns that cannot be predicted from the preference of single individuals. And this that now appears very simple to us was very shocking was, was one of the first model to show the importance of modeling in analyzed complex and social systems. <coughs> Sorry. The second, I'm going to fast, I think, so I, I'm going to finish earlier. Uh, the second problem I'm going to tell you is uh, the one stated by Margaret Robetter. Margaret Robetter is a sociologist. He was a professor of Chinese sociology. I think he passed away very few years ago. And he has very important uh, works. I don't know if anyone here knows the work of uh, Mark Granovetter. I'm going to tell you about the behavior, the collective of crowd, but it has a, a very famous paper uh, called The Importance of Weak Ties. So he, <coughs> if you put the importance of weak ties, Granovetter, you will find what I'm talking about. He study the problem of collective behavior also. And for the time he faced the problem, the current sociolo sociological theories assume that the behavior of a group de depends only of features of each individual. And they focus in norms, preference, motive, and beliefs, and they these theories assume that these features can explain the behavior of a crowd. This, of course, has an um, implicit uh, hypothesis that the way that the, uh, the group relationships build up is, are very simple, are linear. When, when Margaret Robetter say is there are needed a theory of collective behavior because the behavior of a group depends strongly of the interrelation between agents and not depends specifically on individual details. So he say, we have to focus on how 
person connect each other and how heterogeneity could play an important role in the building of collective behavior. So in order to analyze that, he studied the problem of the starting of a riot. He said, how to study collective behavior in a situation where subject has two alternatives. And the cost benefit of choosing one of the alternatives depends on the choosing of the other. So there is a coupling. The way I, I behave, it depends on the way behave the others. <coughs> so he said, well, I'm going to, to make a model for riot. And this model for riot is composed by an agent. And each agent has a single property. That is a threshold. What does threshold mean? This threshold is the proportion of the group he will see joining the riot to join the riot. For instance, a person which thresholds zero is someone that will join the riot without importance of taking care if anyone else is there. So this is the leader. I mean, it's like, just grab a stone, I'm starting the, the riot. So this person with threshold one is a person that if one starts, I go behind him. A threshold with a person two need two people to join the riot and so on and so on. It's OK? So people with low threshold are radicals, for instance, and people with higher threshold are conservatives. But we can say that they are conservatives. <coughs> so he say, it's a very nice paper. It's very simple in terms of mathematics, but it's very nice. Just imagine this, the following situation. We have a group of people milling a, a square, for example. They're angry for some reasons. There is a bank, uh, like in Argentina in 2001. They keep our savings. I'm angry. I don't know what to do. Just appear one, grab a stone, break a glass of the bank. So what happened? Let's assume this simple idea. We have 10 people, and all the people have this distribution of threshold. This is a uniform distribution. We have a people with threshold 0, as I said, a one people with threshold 1, one with threshold 2, and so on. What is going to happen? It's, a, it's called the McWagon effect. I mean, the green one, this win, not, not this, this win with threshold zero, are me that that's grabbing the stone and breaking the blast. The light blue, it could be Gabo. He said, oh, Pablo, break a glass, I'm also break a glass. The second red one, it could be Mauro. He said, oh, see, Gabo and Pablo, break uh, the glass, I'm also, and so on, and every one of you has different threshold, and it's come to appear a cascade, and everyone is protesting. And this is a complete riot. Yes, this is a mess, we have a protest, so on, so on, you can, the police with the, the water, and the, okay, things go bad. <laughs> yes, but the equilibrium situation here, in this model, is that everyone joined the riot. So, Granoberto said, just make a little change in the initial distribution of threshold. Let's assume that it's almost like the previous one. I mean, we have a uniform distribution, but imagine that we have some finite size effect the person with a threshold one is missing. He stayed home, 
whatever, but we have one, thres one person with threshold one, with threshold zero, two with threshold two, and so on. What are going, what are going to happen? Nothing. Just, I break the window, Gabo isn't here, Mauro, look at me and say, he's crazy. <laughs> and you say, he's crazy. <laughs> so, with the picture, I'm just, I'm a, a crazy man breaking a glass. So, the equilibrium situation here is that it's one, one people is joining the riot. So, if I put the television tonight, or tomorrow, we can see very different effects depending this slight variation. Either a violent riot take place in Sao Paulo, in a, in, a, in a place where a lot of students and teachers become crazy, or just a crazy Argentinian that don't want to, to be um, Argentinian loose tonight. <laughs> Again, Brazil, just feel of anger, break uh, a glass, and he was in jail, and so on. So, <coughs> two almost identical crowds produce two different, two different collective behavior, and also this this was a very interesting and very milestone model because it shows how slightly difference in one input parameter could give rise to different, very different collective behavior. If we want to formalize the dynamic of the model, it's very simple. Let's call f of x the threshold distribution. I mean, the input of the model is the threshold distribution, and the idea of the model is can I, given a threshold distribution, can I uh, now how the output, uh, the, the size of the riot, how can I predict the size of the riot? Well, if f of x is the threshold distribution, let's call capital F of x the cumulative threshold distribution. It is how many people have threshold less or equal to x. So, if R of t is the fraction of individual showing it to the riot at time t, the evolution of the system is going by this equation. The amount of people joining the riot at time t plus one, it's going by the amount of people that have threshold like this quantity or less than this. This is the capital F of R of t. So this is the dynamical equation. And of course, the stationary solution is going when the system doesn't evolve anymore. I mean, when R, the population at t plus one, is the same population of t. And the way we can represent this dynamic is with this plot. Let's suppose that this is the cumulative distribution function, and this is the identity function. So it's a time t with have this amount of people, the amount of people that will show, show in the riot at, at, at the next time, it's going to be capital F of R of t. This is going, this, that is if project over the diagonal, this is the population at t plus one. With the population at t plus one, I can now how big it's going to be the population than t plus two. And it follows this iteration process until we reach the equilibrium point. So the equilibrium point is given by the intersection of the cumulative function with the identity function. <coughs> what it is very interesting here is Mark Granovetter say, well, just take the case of um, truncate normal, normal distribution. With a fixed mean, this 25 against uh, 100, 0 0.4, no, 
0.25. And let's vary the variance of this truncate distribution. Yes? So what we he observed here is that this is the equilibrium solution, I mean, the, the number of rioters against the standard deviation of the initial Gaussian truncate distribution of threshold. And we can say here is if we increase the standard deviation, the number of rioters is very few. It, this is starting from a single rioter. And there is a critical standard deviation in which a sudden increase appears and it, there is a discontinuous uh, jump here, and the number of that start here and then start to decrease. So this example show also how very different, a very um, similar distribution could generate very different pattern. So the way we have to understand this is very simple because we have just to plot the cumulative distribution of this normal truncate for the different standard deviation. And we, we can see here how here the equilibrium point is, is very low. When we move, it's here high here, and then it's starting to move it to the left. So if we plot the riot size against the standard deviation for different means of the distribution, for instance, for 0 0.4, we have this jump. The same behavior, quality same behavior, occur if we keep fixed the standard deviation and move the mean of the distribution. And this is also simulation to, for these two cases. This is also from Seba, who helped me with this simulation. And we can see here how a riot start to, people start to get um, involved in the riot, and they, uh, they involve in the riot, but they, they become red. Uh, we can check the, the threshold there. This is a riot of, of, of big size in this part of the curve. But if I change the, the mean of the distribution, we can see that the evolution is very, very different. So we can also, this is, this are plot of the threshold distribution, <coughs> the identity function, and the expected um, size of uh, rioters uh, when we start with different initial condition. And we see that in the case of uniform initial condition, the cumulative distribution match perfectly with identity. So we have multiple equilibrium state. I mean, the system is frozen in the, in the, in the place we, we leave it. There is no dynamics. I mean, some fluctuation due to uh, the finite of the sample. And the same occur with, with the same calculation with a normal truncate uh, distribution. And this is what I would like to, to, to tell you in this, this first class, how threshold model of complex dynamics has a very important ingredient in order to explain how different outcomes could give rise with um, very slight perturbations. Also, this is in the paper of Renovator, he, he said that this is a very simple version, but this version can, can be improved if we add some ingredients of the model in the same way we do with the social uh, ovation problem and be just uh, adding some uh, social structure or weight for friends or temporal and spatial effects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a problem that the, uh, was analyzed many times. So summary. 
<coughs> we have this. I'm not going to read now, but you can read. Um, but um, the modeling of complex systems using simple model could be a very good approach if we know how to, to choose these few variables. I said the, in the election of the important variable if, if the hurt of the modeling in terms of some simple models. And this is a previous what, it, what we are going to see in the next class. So I finish now. So if you have any questions. Yes. What are the boundary conditions? The? Boundary conditions. The, the boundary condition are open. But we, 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 we can do the with the periodic boundary conditions. I mean, uh, I mean we, we can, we, you can flavor the model whatever you want. So uh, I mean, I, I trust just to, to stress the importance of this model with simple rules, how the rich dynamics could, could be had. Yes. I don't know, randomly selecting a, uh, my friend gave a speech here, I have a probability of six. And besides, if I, I have a probability of six on the other side of the museum, or the uh, hexagonal, uh -huh. uh, that's what you do? For instance, of where I can just uh, put a, a network like a grid and put the weights in the grids that are a, a larger form for friends than for strangers, for instance. Okay, and uh, uh, when you got a friend eating a society, uh, well, you can measure, you, you measure differently the nearest neighbors and the next near neighbors, or it's the same? Uh, it depends of <laughs> what I want to do. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I would like to assume that my, my uh, the, my friends and the nearest neighbor, or we are, or we, I can assume that there's some even heterogeneity there, and that I have small groups, larger groups, and how can um, analyze? I mean, in this sense, you, you can take a, 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 a model like a, a lab experiment, a in silico lab experiment. I, I, so let's suppose that I have all just a small group. So that's surrounded, and very few small groups. So how they behave? Or, or let's assume that I have heterogeneity in the size of the groups. And let's see how they behave. And we can run simulation and understand uh, what different ingredients made to, to, the, to the outcomes. Yeah. 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 When you work with a network, it's not a grid. The connections are given by the structure of the network. I mean, I can have an agent, I have four neighbors, and another agent can have 10 neighbors. The way a, net, a complex network is represented in that way, it, it with the adjacency matrix. I mean, the adjacency matrix, if, if I want to represent, let's suppose that I have an agent. So I have a matrix of n by n, and I can put one is they are connected. For example, here, this might say that agent one and two are connected. And this is a binary network. And I can put zero here, one, zero, one. But also, I can add friendship in this framework, because I can say, OK, not all the individuals are connected in the same way. So the individual two is closer to the individual 
one. So I will put here, for example, three. That is the way in the link between them. And I can represent, I can normalize this, et cetera, et cetera, but with a weighted network. And I can plot this, this happen structure. Yeah, uh, depends. <laughs> it could, it depends what kind of relationship. Because uh, if the network is directed, it has not to be symmetric. For instance, in Twitter, there, in Facebook we have symmetric relation. We have a French each other. But in, in Twitter, I can follow uh, Mauro, and Mauro could not follow me. So uh, in this sense, uh, the connection between one and two is different than between two and one. Yeah. For instance. Yeah, it depends on the kind of network you have. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I never do this. I, I mean, uh, you have to, uh, with the same rules. Well, I, I think that uh, what I expected is that the, the pattern segregation just include um, neighbors of different colors. Because if I keep these rules, people are going to share neighborhood with a similar people. So I assume that if I put more colors, I, I'm going to be pretty the same, but with more colors. And what happens with the distribution of the if there's more red than blue? Oh, well, yes. This, this, of course, this, this if I'm more red than the blue, you, you introduce an asymmetry, initial asymmetry. This asymmetry is going to be reflected in the in the size of the clusters. I mean, it's expected that the cluster of the majority people has, has to be bigger than the other ones. See, si, yes. No, this move uh, in the shelling method, it's just moved to an empty place. No. There is no constraints, but I mean, you can play whatever you want. <laughs> yes, Mauro. I was curious about the possibility of extending this two color model to politics, in which you have maybe not a continuum, but like in the political spectrum, political spectrum so left and right, and it's something. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, this is very nice, but it has no sense to frame this problem in a true spatial pattern. I know, but it has to be some abstract uh, space. Facebook space. Yes. So, uh, well, uh, this uh, this is done. What? Yes, this this uh, this exists. Oh, have you done? Yes, something like that. This, if, if you, you go to representation of, of um, ideological preference of people, is used to see this kind of picture that is called Nolan chart. And where we have, you put Nolan chart in Google, and you will see. Economic axis would go to liberal to a more um, estatal, I mean in, in Spanish. I don't remember the name in English. So, but that's an economy based on, on the uh, results of the states. And there is a social axis where we have a liberal or conservative. In such a way, uh, you can, I mean, this is done, people used to place 
in, in, in these two axes upon uh, analyze the, the poles, in uh, this uh, general poles, the, the way when um, the, the census, not the poles, the census. When they, they ask you a lot of questions, and you, and based on the response of the population, we can, we, you can take a representative sample and place the individual of this, and you can do this every time, and you, you can see how distribution moves around the years. This is a, a, a David, there's a lot of works in, 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 in this place, and we are writing a paper in which we have a model of social, I'm going to, to tell you in, in this course, but we are in the process of finishing them, in which we have a model of a mass media influence with ancient places in this kind of space. And the mass media is represented, represent, we, we do this with the election of the United States. And we place the influence of the media related in the way the media reflects the ideological position of the candidates. It's based in, da in data. And we, we, we perform a nation-based simulated model in this space in order to see if simple rules can explain the behavior in the polls before the election. I don't know if this is what's your question, but I take the chance to. <laughs> Yes, I could be liberal in the economics and liberal in social. And here, or I can see, I, I can be liberal in the uh, economics, but conservative in my social aspect. But then I'm curious to see now each of the individuals sit on a network, can you put the model is about how you connect to other people in the social Oh, this is more complicated. This is more complicated because, because that. <laughs> How I, I mean, I have a representation of different individuals and the preference in political, social economics. But if I take a representative sample of this, how can make representative connections between them? We know how to make a representative statistical sample, because you, this is why I have some have to to keep some proportion of women and and and, uh, and men, and age um, statement, etc., etc., etc. But if I just remove this individual and put in a network, this network is somehow represent connection between them, and this is going to be a representative network of the whole general network of a country. I have not an idea how to do that. Different question. Yeah. Um, I know that there are other approaches to these kind of more complex social dynamics that are based only on the data. Yeah. Rather than trying to embed the local rules and the agents. You pull the data and you try to make predictions by some machine learning techniques. Yeah. Which is the relationship between the two approaches? Is there people trying to... Yeah, if people work in that, I mean... Connect something. Yeah. It looks like radically different. They are radical different. I, I, I know people that, I mean, there's a part of the community working in these kind of models, and also I, uh, people working in machine learning techniques using to classify and to, to understand this. I mean, the, the paradigmatic case is the, Cambridge Analyt the paper that gives rise to Cambridge Analytica, for instance, uh, about the, how to classify people according to how many predictions or how many likes in Facebook do you put. There is also a, a work uh, in Twitter with that. But um, I, I haven't seen connection between these two approaches so far. I think that is coming. Can we take the 
Yes, we take the break and then let it continues later. So please, the people who chose yes. to go first. We have around four groups that chose a paper related with uh, birds flocking. Uh, yes? You, you can approach to us and, and we can discuss alternatives. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to know where did the